The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. My name is Tom Fresh, your host, and we want to continue with the book, The Ark and the Dove. This book is going to teach us how Roman Catholicism got a foothold in this country. How do we explain how the Vatican has control of our government? And the, the, the second beast of Revelation 13, which I assert is the United States of America, which had two horns like a lamb but spoke as a dragon. How is it that this lamb-like nation began to speak like the dragon? Another portion of scripture where the dragon is mentioned is, and the dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority. This nation should tremble at the notion that the Bible equates the dragon with the way the United States speaks. The United States speaks like a dragon, according to the Bible. And the dragon is Satan. And we want to know how the transformation took place, that this lamb-like Christian nation should become perverted and apostate and evil and wicked in the world. This book hopefully will help us to understand that. Again, The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives. Right now we're talking about uh, uh, John Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore, and I'll back up a paragraph from where we left off last week for continuity purposes. It says, John Calvert now bowed to the inevitable. He refused to serve on the commission and publicly announced his allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church. He had no difficulty in convincing the king, now on the verge of death, that the duties of his office were no longer compatible with his religious belief. The king respected his wishes and suffered him to resign from office and retire to private life. He held large estates under royal grant and anticipated that that he would not be allowed to longer hold these lands without taking the oath of supremacy. He surrendered them. He was willing to pay a heavy penalty for his change of faith. The king, in great gracious recognition of the loyalty and worth of Calvert, restored his estates with the religious clause omitted and asked him to remain as a member of the Privy Council. Although Calvert knew that the king was favorably disposed to him, he also recognized the growing power of the Protestant party and realized that he could no longer hold public office. In one, in one particular, at least, James rose superior to his predecessor on the throne Elizabeth, when she turned on the English Catholics, who had come to her support when the Armada, the Spanish Armada, threatened the kingdom, showed that she was unworthy of the full measure of loyalty which her Catholic subjects had given her. James may have been a coward, but he was no ingrate. He did not forget the loyalty and devotion of George Calvert. One of the last acts of his reign was to elevate his faithful minister to the Irish peerage as Lord Baltimore. 
in recognition of his singular gifts of mind, candor, integrity, and prudence, as well as benignity and urbanity toward all men. When George Calvert made public confession of his faith, it was a step that could only have been taken by a man of rare courage. It meant for him the surrender of high office, and with all the privileges, emoluments, and influence that went with it. It meant liability of incurring the penalties and disabilities of the penal laws, now to be enforced with greater rigor. He saw in the rising tide of anti-Catholicism, he saw in the rising tide of anti-Catholicism in Parliament, the prospect that the ancient faith, that is Catholicism, would soon be driven from the realm of England. To this faith, notwithstanding, he gave his support and allegiance. No historian has ever heard, ha, ever been heard to say that Calvert's open profession of faith was not sincere and not the result of inward conviction. Bancroft says, quote, In an age when religious controversy still continued to be active, and when increasing divisions among Protestants were spreading a general alarm, his mind sought relief from controversy in the bosom of the Roman Catholic Church, and preferring the avowal of his opinions to the, emanual, the, the emoluments of office, he resigned his place and openly professed his conversion, unquote. According to Wilhelm, quote, Calvert's conversion to the Catholic religion was thorough and honest through the change of belief, uh, excuse me, though the change of belief had been gradual. At a crisis in his career, he made an open profession of his adherence to the papacy and accepted the consequences. The Church of Rome offered him, in, in his distress of mind, a surer peace than the deeply stirred Church of England or the aggressive fold of the, of the Puritans." Unquote. There's the testimony of some of Calvert's contemporaries and those not of his faith that he had been a, he had been a Catholic at heart for some time prior to his resignation from office. Archbishop Abbott of Canterbury, who was secretly opposed to the Spanish marriage, yet willing to put his uh, signature to the treaty, wrote that Secretary Calvert had never looked merrily since the prince, the, the prince's coming out of Spain, and that he had apparently turned papist when he now professeth this being the third time he hath been to blame that way, unquote. The Anglican Bishop Goodman wrote, quote, He was thought to gain by the Spanish match and did what good offices uh, did what good offices he could therein for religion's sake, being in, infinitely uh, addicted to the Roman Catholic faith, having been converted thereto by Count Gondomar and Lord Arundale, whose daughter, Secretary Calvert's son, had married. And it was said the secretary did, did usually catechize his own children, so to ground them in his own religion, and in his best room having an altar set up with chalice, candlesticks, and all other ornaments. He brought all strangers thither, never concealing anything as if his whole joy and comfort had been to make open confession of his religion." Unquote. There's no reason to believe that Count Gondomar and any uh, excuse me. There's no reason to believe that Count Gondomar had any influence upon Calvert so far as his change of faith is concerned. His attitude on the question of the of the Spanish treaty was largely the result of his own convictions, and he had evidently decided to make open confession of his real faith, regardless of the result of the negotiations it's far more likely that he was influenced by Lord Arendale, as there was the closest relationship between the two families. According to the Aspinwall Papers, he began to turn towards the Catholic faith in 1620, but nothing was revealed of his state of mind until February of 1625, when he, quote, made known his change of faith to the king, and then went to the north of England with Sir Tobias Matthews, to be received into the church, unquote. Matthews was an old schoolmate of Calvert. He was the son of an Anglican bishop of Durham, 
but had himself become reconciled to the church, uh, excuse me, to the Catholic religion, much to the disgust of his father. The same authority states that Matthews was a Jesuit, but his name does not appear in the lists in the Jesuit archives. He had been knighted by King James for his service in connection with the Spanish treaty negotiations and was one of, one of the witnesses of George, Cal, George Calvert's last will. On his retirement from public life, we find the figure of George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore, standing out in bold relief against a dark and sinister background of political intrigue and religious animosities. That he remained aloof from the partisan influences that surrounded him is revealed by his life and character. He was tolerant in a day of intolerance, open-minded during a reign of bigotry, kind and considerate of others when cruelty was easily excused and quickly condoned, charitable in his opinions of his fellow men when harsh judgment was the order of the day, and above reproach in his family and private life when a refined immorality spread its thin, its thin veneer over the lives of men and women. He became easily reconciled to withdraw from public life and to seek a refuge from political strife and religious controversy beyond the seas. Beyond the seas to the colonies of the United States. And, it's, and we begin chapter 5 now, which is entitled, Westward Ho for Avalon. Westward Ho for Avalon. In the year 1620, when the pilgrims of the Mayflower landed on New England's stern and rock-bound coast, George Calvert purchased from a former classmate at Oxford, Sir William Vaughan, a plantation on the stony coast of Newfoundland. It would seem as if the voyage of the Mayflower, which came within his official purview as Secretary of State, had turned his attention to need to the need of a colonial refuge for religious, uh, religiously oppressed. Sir Edward Sandys had already sent his invitation to the pilgrim exiles in Holland to repatriate themselves to America. But there was no progress made with the plan until Calvert became Secretary of State. Matthew Page Andrews, in his History of Maryland, has brought out that there is a logical inference, at least, quote, in the light of other events that, as Secretary of State, Calvert must have aided the separatists, directly or indirectly, in obtaining their patent, which unfortunately is among the missing documents of history, unquote. It would not have been possible for any such migration as that of the pilgrims of the Mayflower to have been arranged without the knowledge and consent of the Privy Council, and much would have been much would have depended, so far as any favorable action was concerned, on the recommendation of one of the secretaries of state, Calvert's colleague in the secretary in the secretaryship, Robert Naunton, who was subsequently disgraced and deprived of office, was given mostly routine matters to to attend to while the more important matters having to do with foreign and colonial affairs were entrusted to the king and his new secretary. It was no easy matter for any large group to secure permission to settle in the American colonies. A band of Huguenots who had fled to the Netherlands to escape persecution in France tried to obtain permission from the English government to settle in America, and being unsuccessful in this, came over under Dutch auspices to settle New Amsterdam. It was not a foregone conclusion by any means that the English separatists who had gone to Holland to escape conformity in England would be permitted to make an English settlement in America. For all that is known of Calvert and his tolerant views, it's more than probable that he was largely responsible for granting permission to the Mayflower pilgrims to settle in the, in the New England. Calvert received a grant of the entire island of, excuse me, Calvert received a grant of the entire island of Newfoundland in 1622. The entry in the state paper simply reads, quote, grant to Sir George, uh, George Calvert and his heirs of the whole country of Newfoundland, unquote. 
This was held by him only a few months. He applied for and received in April 1623 the charter of Avalon, the name he gave to his new colony. This was one of the earliest instruments of the organization of English colonists on the North American coast. The document was prepared by Calvert himself and later was made by him the model for his charter of Maryland. It introduced for the first time in English colonial history a palatine form of government. This system of government for minor principalities came into use in England during the 13th century. The counts and earls palatine ruling over entire countries as independent princes swearing homage and fealty to the king. At the time of the granting of the charter, the bishopric of Dunham, excuse me, the bishopric of Durham was the only instance of a complete county palatinate in England. The same rights were given to Calvert and his heirs, quote, as any bishop within the bishopric or county palatinate of Durham in our kingdom of England ever has, unquote. The ancient bishopric of Durham, with its majestic Norman cathedral mirrored in the clear waters of the of the Ware, had long been a semi-independent government. The American colonists, however, were given under the Avalon Charter more liberty and self-government than was enjoyed by the by the free men in the Durham bishopric, since an elective assembly curbed the sovereignty of the proprietary. Old Mixon, an early English authority on colonial history, throws interesting light on the Newfoundland grant to Calvert. Quote, This gentleman being of the Romish religion, the Roman Catholic religion, often referred to as the Romish religion, was uneasy at home and had the same reason to leave the kingdom as those gentlemen who had went to, to uh, New England to enjoy liberty of conscience. He therefore resolved to retire to America and finding that the Newfoundland Company made no use of their grant, he thought of this place for his re he thought of this place for his retreat, to which end he procured a patent for that part of the land that lies between the Bay of Bulls in the east and Cape Mary's on the south. Unquote. According to this same authority, Calvert was a Catholic when he procured the grant, and he gives this as the reason why the, col the colony was called by him Avalon, out of veneration to the memory of Joseph of Arimathea, who is fabled, quote, by the Papists to have landed in Britain and to have built a chapel for the Britons of Glastonbury, uh, Somersetshire, then called Avalon, unquote. An old legend gives a little different version for the name, for it says that Avalon was the name in honor of Avalonius, a monk who was supposed to have converted the British king, Lucius, and his court to Christianity. In memory of this event, the Abbey of Glastonbury was said to have been founded. There's a strong presumption that the name of Avalon was suggested to Calvert by a member of the Catholic clergy, as it was hoped that the gospel according to the ancient faith would be practiced and preached for the first time in the English colonies in America at Avalon. Dr. George D. Morris, Lutheran clergyman and historian, says, quote, As one of the oldest historians of Newfoundland, Newfoundland attributes Sir George Calvert's design in planting his colony at Avalon to the desire of making a place of retreat for English Catholics, in which he is followed by other subsequent historians, such motive being founded on strong probability may be safely admitted, unquote. Calvert was preparing his Avalon Charter during the fall and winter of 1622 after the death of his wife, and while he was engaged in the negotiation for the Spanish marriage, the Spanish marriage treaty, he was in sympathy with the plans for the relief of the English Catholics from persecution and discriminatory laws, but he knew that if the negotiations were not successful, and there was no certainty that they would be, there would be little hope for Catholics obtaining the relief they sought, and in that event, the colony of Avalon 
would be a place of refuge for them. At the very time he was drafting the clause in the treaty for the equal administration of the laws on religion and exemption from persecution, he was at work on the charter of Avalon with its broad provisions in the matter of religion. These facts show that the trend of his mind at this time was in the direction of a greater toleration, and that his chief purpose of securing the Newfoundland Charter was to provide an American sanctuary for the English Catholics, who were as much in need of it as the Puritans, who then were migrating to New England. In the early colonial charters, Catholics were barred by provisions which carried the disabilities of the, Eth the Elizabethan laws to the colonies. The Virginia Charter of 1609 required the oath of supremacy to be taken by all settlers. In the confirmation of the Charter of 1612, instead of the Oath of Supremacy, King James' Oath of Allegiance could be taken, the colonial officials having the power to administer neither, neither, excuse me, the colonial officials having the power to administer either or both, and so were enabled, if they chose, to debar Catholics. This power was invoked in 1629 to keep Lord Baltimore out of the colony when he came there from Newfoundland. All anti-Catholic restrictions and disabilities were kept out of the Charter of Avalon because the draftsman intended to omit them so that he might open the door of his colony to Catholic settlers. Calvert was familiar with the provisions of the Virginia Charters. He had been a member of the Second Virginia Company in 1609, and he was also one of the provisional counsel for the management of the colony after revocation of its charter. He had had experience in charters and charter drafting, and he knew what he was doing. Father Hughes has given an interesting commentary on the religious feature of the Avalon Charter. Quote, The intolerance which had introduced test oaths into civil existence, and which was fostering the growth at that moment on the soil of the New World, was not to be found in Calvert's earlier charter of Avalon. Nor had any mention been made there of the Anglo-American formulas about the superstition of the Church of Rome. Calvert had merely spoken of, quote, God's holy and true religion, unquote, which, like allegiance to civil authority, was to suffer no prejudice or diminution. All other artificial elements or odious incidents of an ancient people that had known strife and sorrow, like the laws of police and revenue, such as are enforced by penalties, the mode of ma the mode of maintenance for the establishment, uh, excuse me, for the established clergy, the jurisdiction of spiritual courts, and a multitude of other provisions were neither necessary nor convenient for them and therefore were not in force. And so with respect to the whole network of penal laws, the Catholic proprietary left in their native habitat those sanguinary and, uh, and predatory intrigues which still found England a happy hunting ground and were to keep Ireland a rich preserve for two centuries to come and keeping a free hand for equipping conscience and religion with the rights with their rights he assumed civil freedom of a respectable and congenial home unquote so seeking religious liberty calvert making provisions for liberty of conscience in his new colony and we'll talk more about it when we get back from the break we're reading from the book the Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives, and we'll continue our discussion right after this. You're listening to Inquisition Update. The book of Revelation says... The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app. 
for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening hear it first on firstamendmentradio.com and firstamendmentradio.net visit crossthborder.org c-r-o-s-s crossthborder.org to get your print epub or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update. Now we'll continue in the book, The Ark and the Dove, by J. Moss Ives. Under Section 4 of the Avalon Charter, Calvert had a provision inserted which gave him, quote, the patronage and advowsons of all churches, which as the Christian religion shall increase within said region, isles, and limits shall shall happen thereafter be to be erected. Unquote. 
Here was privilege only, which he could exercise or not as he saw fit. It did not prevent the erection of any Christian church, Catholic or Protestant. The provisions relating to churches and religion in both the Avalon and Maryland charters are somewhat vague and indefinite, and this fact has led some non-Catholic historians to charge Calvert with having a secret understanding with the king, with whom he connived for the purpose of, quote, blinding the public mind, unquote. He may have been disingenuous. Possibly there was a secret understanding between him and the king, but if so, it was all quite proper and justified. It was well that the real meaning of the charter was hidden, else the enemies of tolerance would have thwarted an, un an accomplishment that was commendable and ideal. The non-Catholic historian Cobb has said, if circumstances ever justified a deceptive turn of words, they certainly justified this, quote, blinding purpose, unquote, of Baltimore, close all quotes. Calvert made no definite plans to visit Avalon until he retired to Ireland after his resignation and became Lord Baltimore. At that time, according to Archbishop Abbott, he bought a ship of 400 tons. This was undoubtedly the Ark, which afterwards made two trips to Avalon and then sailed with the Dove to Maryland. His visit was postponed for two years for some unknown reason, and in the meantime affairs in England had assumed a more threatening aspect. James had died soon after uh, elevating Calvert to the peerage, and his ill-fated son had, be had come to the throne as Charles I. Before the marriage of Charles to Henrietta Maria, Cardinal Richelieu had insisted that the same concessions should be made for the English Catholics as were promised in the case of the proposed Spanish marriage. This demand coming so soon after the orders of King James to the judges and magistrates and his promises to Parliament created a difficulty which was finally compromised by a secret treaty granted to Catholics as great a freedom of religion as they would have as they would have had if the Spanish marriage had been consummated. Both James and Charles signed this and ratified it with their oaths. Faced with a hostile parliament soon after his coronation, Charles determined to violate the treaty. Every provision was violated, even those relating to the Queen's household. The penal laws were put into execution, and again Catholic recusants were fined and imprisoned. The king of France rem remonstrated, but Charles dared not face his opponents in Parliament, and as an, ex and an, and as an excuse to Lewis, he said he had never considered the stipulations in favor of Catholics as any more than an artifice to obtain the papal dispensation for the marriage. Lord Baltimore then heeded the call of Westward Ho for Avalon. In a letter to his friend Wentworth, dated on May 21st, 1627, Baltimore wrote that he had finally received the royal consent to cross the ocean, and that he would soon have the pleasure of carrying out his long-deferred desire of visiting Newfoundland. He promised to remain but a few months, and to return not later than Michaelmas. He took with him on his first trip two Catholic priests, and a secular clergy, Father Rivers and Longvilla. Longvilla. Father Rivers was a former Jesuit. Later Jesuit missionaries were sent. As soon as he announced his change of faith, Baltimore had applied for missionaries to be sent to Avalon and had partly arranged for sending members of the Order of Discalced and Barefooted Carmelites. But his arrangement was never carried out as two priests of this order who were to have gone to have gone to prison then excuse me who were to have gone were then in prison there having been a sudden flare of persecution in England against the Catholic clergy it must be clear that Baltimore's reasons for now going to Avalon were mainly religious 
Although he may have hoped that the colony would prosper and that the fishing industry would be profitable, there's nothing to indicate that it was purely a money-making venture for him. The establishment of a colony as far north as Newfoundland could have offered little hope and inducement in a financial way. In fact, the colony caused its founder to suffer a loss of over 20,000 pounds sterling. The biography of Britannica said of him that he differed with others who were planning American settlements at the time and that he was for the in that he was for converting the Indians instead of exploiting them that he was for taking quote the soberest people to these places while others were taking the lewdest unquote and while others were were for making profit were making present profit he said he he was satisfied with a reasonable expectation both Protestant and Catholic clergy accompanied the colonists to Avalon and were granted the fullest freedom in the matter of religious worship. The first Protestant incumbent was Reverend Richard James, a clergyman of the, sta the established church who was sent over in 1622 with the first party of settlers. Having tried, having tried it with, quote, its eight or nine months of winter, unquote, he abandoned it for the more congenial post of librarian to Sir Robert Colton in England. In a document of Jesuit missionary relations released by the nuncio at Brussels in 1630 is found this report of the settlement at Avalon, quote, as to the practice of religion that was carried on under Calvert's roof, in one part Massachusetts was said according to the Catholic rite. In another, the heretics performed their functions, unquote, and it says, here indeed was an unheard of measure of religious liberty, with Catholics and Protestants worshiping under the same roof. Lord Baltimore was greatly misled in respect to the natural advantages of Newfoundland. No high-pressure land salesman of his day could have painted in more glowing colors the attractions of a, pros a prospective re uh, reality excuse me, a more prospective realty development than Captain Richard Whitbourne described, uh, described the imagined beauties of Newfoundland in his Westward Ho for Avalon, which was published in 1622. Whitbourne described the island as a veritable earthly paradise with raspberries, strawberries, pears, and cherries growing in abundance and flowers of every kind, including red and uh, damask roses, making Meadowlands beauteous to behold. It says, The woods are vocal with songbirds that rival the nightingale. The wild beasts are, quote, gentle and humane, unquote. The harbor's eminently good, and in St. Saint, uh, Saint John's Harbor, and in St. John's Harbor had seen a mermaid. <laughs> Baltimore may have been impressed, I'm sorry, Baltimore may have been impressed with this glowing description, but he was soon to be sadly disillusioned, for he found that, quote, it was not always June in Avalon. <laughs> it says the, the bleak coast had been made to blossom with the names of beauty. There was the Bay of Pleasance, the Bay of Flowers, the Harbor of Heartsease, as, Ingleton, uh, as Eggleston says, when winter came, uh, when winter time came, quote, the icy bay of uh, Pleasance and the bleak bay of flowers mocked him with their names of delight, unquote. You can imagine the winters are, are brutal in Newfoundland. And it says, All, although on his first trip, Baltimore came at the most favorable season of the year and his stay was short, he failed to find the Garden of Eden described by Captain Whitbourne. He found only a small strip of land fitted for cultivation, and, quote, all behind the little plantation lay this region of wild savagery and bleak and hopeless desolation, and in front, of the, and, and in front was the wild, stormy, and inhospitable sea, unquote. And he had yet to see the northern winter. In the summer of 1628, the ships of Lord Baltimore again crossed the sea to Avalon. 
This time, he brought Lady Baltimore, his second wife, and several members of his family. With him also came 40 colonists, including three Jesuit missionaries. Trouble soon came. First, a French fleet came to attack the colony, England being at war with France. Baltimore was not a fighting man, but fight now he must. There was no other recourse. He fitted his, he fitted his ships, one of them the Ark, as men of war, and they were so well handled by the English seamen that with the help of the Unicorn, an English man of war, the attacking French fleet soon had the worst of it. How distasteful all this was to him is shown in a letter written at the time to Buckingham, in which he said, quote, I came to build and set and sow, but I'm fain, I'm fain to fighting with Frenchmen who have disquieted me, unquote. The war with France was of Buckingham's making, and after the smoke of the battle cleared, Baltimore wrote to the, fa to the favorite, saying, quote, Whether the French gentleman may return again when the ships are gone, I know not. But if he do, we shall defend this place as well as we are able, unquote, and ask that two men of war be allowed to remain all year. Before the letter reached the destination, Buckingham had been assassinated. The St. Cloud, one of the captured ships, was loaned to Baltimore, quote, in consideration of his good services, unquote, and was brought out to him by his son Leonard, afterwards governor of Maryland. When bigotry raised its head in the person of a Puritan minister, the Reverend Erasmus Stoughton, whether this clergyman came by invitation or as an, unbidding, uh, an unbidden guest is not disclosed, but come he did and found hospitality and sanctuary. This did not deter him, however, from stirring up trouble for his host. He was horrified because Jesuit priests said Mass every Sunday and used, quote, all other ceremonies of the Church of Rome in as ample manner as is used in Spain, unquote. And he had seen with his own eyes a Presbyterian child actually baptized by a Romish priest, this was enough to send him back to England on trouble bent. As soon as he landed, he went straight to the mayor of Plymouth with his tale of popish doings. The magistrates of Plymouth were greatly shocked and sent the informer to the Privy Council. Unfortunately, Baltimore and his friends in the Privy Council, to whom differences in matters of religion meant little, nothing more was heard of the complaint. Bigotry had failed in its purpose, and the tail-bearer had spent his shaft. But the, but the worst enemy of all was soon to come, and this was the northern winter. Baltimore, in his own words, tells of the suffering of his colony in the long, cold winter of 1860, or excuse me, 1628 and 29. In a letter to his king written in the following summer, he says, quote, I have met with difficulties and encumbrances here, which in this place are no longer to be resisted, but and forced me presently to quit my residence and to shift to some other warmer climate of the new world where the winters will be shorter and less rigorous, unquote. From the middle of October to the middle of May, he, wrote, he writes, quote, There's a sad fair of winter upon all this land, both sea and land, so frozen for the greater part of the time as they're not penetrable, no plant or vegetation, th uh, vegetable thing appearing out of the earth until about the beginning of May, nor fish in the sea. Besides, the air is so intolerable cold as it is hardly, hardly to be endured, unquote. His house had been a hospital all through the long winter, a hundred persons sick at a time, and because of his own illness, he was not able to minister to the wants of others. Ten had died during the winter, broken in health and with a considerable loss of fortune. He was almost on the point of giving up further plans of colonization. That there was some deep underlying motive other than the expectation of profit that led him to make another attempt is indicated in the, in the following, which appears in his letter to the king. Quote, Hereupon I have had a strong temptation to leave all proceedings in plantations 
and being much decayed in my strength to retire myself to my former quiet. But my inclinations carry me naturally to these kinds of works, and not knowing how better to employ the poor remainder of my days than with other good subjects, to further the best I may, the enlarging your majesty's empire in this part of the world, I am determined to commit this place to fishermen that are able to encounter the storms and hard weather and to remove myself for some 40 and, and with some 40 persons to your majesty's dominion virginia where if your majesty will please to grant me a, a precinct of land with such privileges as the king your father my gracious master was pleased to grant me here i shall endeavor to the utmost of my power to deserve it unquote. if it is to be noted Excuse me, it is to be noted that Baltimore was careful to include his request to include in his request for a new grant the same privileges which King James had granted to him in the Avalon Charter. Without these, his main purpose in affording an asylum for the religiously oppressed would have been defeated. Charles wrote in reply, reminding Baltimore that men of his, his condition and breeding were fitter for other employment, quote, than the framing of new plantations which commonly have rugged and laborious beginnings and require much greater means in managing, managing them than usually the power of one private subject can reach unto, unquote. The king advised him to give up the further, pers uh, further prosecution of his plans and return to England, quote, where he would enjoy both the liberty of a subject and such respect for us as your former services and late endeavors do so justly deserve, unquote. There was a gracious side to the, ch to the character of Charles revealed in this kindly letter to, to a, ro a loyal subject of another faith. But in those days, it would have taken more than the favor and respect of a king to ensure to a Catholic, quote, the liberty of a subject, unquote. Charles's advice was not heeded, and before the letter was written, Lord Baltimore had, had set sail for Avalon for a sunnier clime. He had set sail from Avalon for a sunnier clime. Now, chapter 6 of the book is entitled The Promised Land. <clears throat> we won't get it far into this before, uh, before the end of the program, but I'll get started anyway. Lord Baltimore and his little band of colonists sailed from the bleak hills of Newfoundland and came to the coast of Virginia in the summer of 1629. It's believed that the two Catholic priests accompanied the party, but whether these were secular priests or Jesuits is not certain. He found the southern climate much warmer than his welcome at Jamestown. Virginia was at this time under royal grant, the charter of the Virginia Company having been revoked. When Baltimore arrived, the assembly was in session. He was not long in finding out that he had come into a stronghold of conformity where no Catholics were granted. The Virginians hated Papists more than they did the Puritans. Here was a popish recusant in their midst, and a nobleman of rank and prestige who was known to be in the favor of the king. When they saw that he seemed, quote, well affected, unquote, toward their part of the country, and had plans for a colony where papists would be granted refuge from the restraints of the recusancy laws in England, great was their dismay. But they were sorely, comp they were sorely perplexed to know just what to do. To have a Roman Catholic set up a colony in their midst, or even on their borders, was to them unthinkable. Theirs was a colony from which Catholics had been carefully excluded, and where the provisions of their laws aimed at strict religious uniformity. They soon made it apparent that they did not wish to, to have Lord Baltimore for a neighbor, and a way was discovered to get rid of him, which they believed would be legally justifiable. The oath of supremacy was the modus operandi. This oath went further than the oath of allegiance, which Catholic subjects were willing to take. The oath of supremacy was specially designed to make Catholics refuse to recognize the spiritual supremacy of the Pope 
and to recognize the king of England as the head of the church. It was the chief weapon of enforced conformity. Baltimore offered to take a modified form of oath, which would have recognized the supremacy of the king in all temporal matters, but this he was not allowed to do. Mere allegiance to the king in matters temporal was not enough. He must swear subservience to the king in matters spiritual as well, and acknowledge him as the titular head of the church. They knew that he would not take this form of oath. As a matter of fact, they exceeded their legal powers in trying to compel a visiting nobleman to subscribe to the oath of supremacy, and it is doubtful if the assembly had any power to compel the oath, as this power was in the Charter of Virginia, which had been annulled. The acting governor of Virginia at the time was Dr. James Potts, and it says Sir George Sandy had written a letter to a friend in London that the doctor, quote, kept company too much with his inferiors who hung upon him while his good liquor lasted, unquote. He was afterwards charged with abusing his powers by pardoning a, a culprit who had been convicted of willful murder. In addition to this, he was convicted of stealing some of his neighbor's cattle and sentenced to jail. He was later released on a pardon because he was the best physician in the colony and skilled in epide epidemicals, unquote. Although he loved his neighbor, although he loved his neighbor's cattle, he had little love for his neighbors. He was extremely bitter against Catholics and determined that none of that faith should abide in Virginia. He was the first signer of a letter to the Privy Council setting forth the reasons why Lord Baltimore was not allowed to take the oath of allegiance in lieu of the oath of supremacy. So anxious was he to demonstrate to the authorities at home that he was a loyal churchman. Quote, we could not imagine, the letter states, that so much latitude was left us to decline from the prescribed form of strict, uh, so strictly and exacted, unquote. The letter then goes on to expiate on the Virginia idea of religious freedom. Quote, Among the many blessings and favors for which we are bound to bless God and which this colony has received from His most gracious majesty, there's none whereby it none whereby it hath been made more happy than in the freedom of our religion, which we have enjoyed, and that no papists have been supposed to settle their abode among us, the continuance whereof we must humbly implore from his most sacred majesty." Unquote. Baltimore, fully realizing that Virginia was no place for him and his colonists, made plans to return to England. But before his departure, he had to suffer a personal indignity. It is a matter of record that when Thomas Tyndall was pilloried for giving Lord, giving, for quote, giving my Lord Baltimore the lie and threatening to knock him down, unquote. This punishment, however, was not meted out until Baltimore's departure and after Governor Henry, uh, Harvey had arrived in Virginia. We'll continue with the reading of the Ark and the Dove tomorrow on Inquisition Update. It's been my pleasure to host this morning. Join me again tomorrow. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur across the board. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. 
These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossTheBorder.org.